I think that we are living, as Dickens would say, in the best of times and the worst of times. There are many innovative things happening in the field of democracy. If you visit South Africa, if you visit India. But there are also terrible things going on. These are the worst of times. There are growing numbers of unsolved problems that threaten democracy, its spirit, it's as if there are emerging bundles of problems for which Democrats and democratic institutions have no solutions. I think we face a real crisis in the Western world. What you see is the fundamental inability in every Western society to do one thing, which is to impose any kind of short-term pain for long-term gain. Whenever a government tries to propose some kind of pain, there is a revolt. And the revolt is almost always successful. Leaders should be ahead of time, should have a vision, not just look, look at the public opinion poll. Politicians, because they want to get a vote, sometimes they sacrifice a country's long-term interest only for short-term gain. I think it's been a pretty bad state. If you think about this crisis, instead of seeing democracy take back control over money, which ought to be a common resource, the, the powers that control money for their own purposes have effectively taken over government. I would say that probably among many people that you would talk to, I'm much more optimistic about our democracies than not. Um, our democracies show tremendous warts. Uh, they show their dirty laundry. Uh, it, their, their faults are daily reminders for us. And for me, that's very much their strength. Over vier weken beleven we weer het feest van de democratie. Maar hoe leuk is dat feestje eigenlijk nog? Zijn we nog wel in staat om nieuw leven in ons politieke systeem te blazen? Of zijn we getuigen van de laatste stuiptrekkingen op weg naar een nieuw tijdperk na de democratie? In dat laatste geval is de grote vraag hoe die nieuwe tijd eruit zou kunnen zien. En welke invloed de opnieuw ontwakende reus van het oosten op dit proces heeft. Komt hij onze kant op? Of wijst hij ons de weg in dat landschap na de democratie? Deze vragen legden we voor aan vijf vooraanstaande denkers over het wel en wee van de democratie. John Keane, Brit en Australiër, professor of politics aan het Center for the Study of Democracy in Londen en schrijver van The Life and Death of Democracy. Hilary Wainwright, Britse, feministe, socialiste en verbonden aan het Transnational Institute. Schrijfster van Reclaim the State, Experiments in Popular Democracy. Farid Zakaria, Amerikaan van Indiase komaf, schrijvend voor Newsweek, presentator bij CNN en schrijver van onder meer The Post-American World. William Dobson, Amerikaan, voorheen werkzaam bij Foreign Policy en de Carnegie Endowment en werkend aan het boek The Dictator's Learning Curve. En Cheng Li, Amerikaan van Chinese afkomst, fellow aan het Brookings Institution in Washington en samensteller van China's Changing Political Landscape, Prospects for Democracy. We beginnen met de historicus en een fijne essentiële binnenkomer. Is democratie een historische noodzakelijkheid? The history of democracy is full of examples uh, of, uh, of thinkers, of figures that have supposed that democracy has some kind of historical inevitability. Beginning, for example, in the Athenian assembly, where uh, you will see from the speeches and from the plays and the poems uh, a deep-seated belief among its male citizens that Athenian democracy was inevitable, that the gods 
had blessed, Demokratia, that this explained why Athens had come to be the imperial power in the Greek world and why its future was assured. Sun Yat-sen, in famous lectures in the 1920s in China, preached the view to many thousands of people who gathered to hear these public lectures that democracy has uh, several historical phases. Democracy, he claimed, uh, was originally a Chinese invention. It had then moved to the West and it was being reinvented in the East and the future was bright for Eastern democracy, which would be the culmination of a certain historical inevitability. And final example in our times, uh, it was Francis Fukuyama, who famously in the spring of 1989 wrote the essay uh, at the right time, which uh, effectively proposed that there was no intellectual alternative to so-called American-style liberal democracy. It turns out that uh, these views are not only controversial, they're deeply mistaken in my view, because even a cursory glance at the history of democracy shows its fragility. It is easily killed off by war, by the breakdown of class agreements. Uh, it is destroyed by uh, pauperization, elite panic. The panic of elites can destroy, as happened in Weimar, for example, um, can destroy democracy. Um, it is a very tender plant. De democratie is geen klaproos die vanzelf overal opduikt, maar een teerplantje dat gekoesterd en verzorgd moet worden. We vermoeden al zoiets. Maar wat gaat er precies mis met democratia? Want het gaat nu even niet zo goed met het plantje. Dat is althans de bevinding van Freedom House, een onafhankelijke NGO die al 40 jaar de stand van de democratie bijhoudt. For the first time in the 40 years that they've been issuing this report, there's been a four-year consecutive decline in political and economic freedom around the world. Um, so uh, they, would, they would say that right now there is a freedom recession going on around the world. Um, we have the fewest electoral democracies that we have had since 1995. Um, and the overall number of people who are uh, countries that are that are free has stagnated at 46%, and that's been the case since 1998. I think that um, the, o the older system of democracy that we had in the West, and I mean only 30 or 40 years ago, was a more Aristotelian system. Ar Aristotle talked about a mixed regime, by which he meant every government has elements of democracy, elements of aristocracy, and these are blended together. And the aristocratic element of government was a certain kind of long-term vision for society. And that long-term vision was expressed despite what people might think at this moment. And so there was a tendency to, uh, to outweigh public opinion for the moment with these longer-term concerns. And I'd say certainly that is the way in which an Adenauer functioned in Germany, a de Gaulle functioned in France. Um, that is the way in which an Eisenhower functioned in the United States. That there was, yes, there were populist clamors of the moment, but there was also a longer term sense of what the country needed. The trends are clear in practically every democracy. Parties which are supposed to be the conduit, the lifeline, the link between citizens and government decision making parties are breaking down. There is now a strong possibility, looking into the future, that parties will not perform any significant functions. Imagine a democracy uh, in which political parties play a marginal role. It's easy to imagine, 
because that is indeed what is going on. A class of people who um, seem to be constantly um, circulating um, around the sort of top jobs, you know, um, so that uh, in Britain, I mean, I think it's the same in, in most European countries, but, you know, when a minister leaves uh, office or when there's an election and they lose, they don't go back to being like an ordinary person. They become the head of a bank or a director of a big company. And so, uh, and this is happening just all the time, so that um, it looks like politicians, I mean, the principle of a representative democracy originally was the idea that people would be elected and then, you know, challenged and sometimes diselected. Um, and then they would go back to being ordinary people. The purpose of the, the elected representative is to listen to citizens, to take their advice, to lead openly, honestly, and to accept that after a term in office, the representative has to come back to face the music, uh, to listen to the verdict, and either to be returned or thrown out onto the streets. Uh, in England, this is called getting rid of the bastards. Politicians have in a way sold their, their soul, if you like, to the markets. Um, they've, I mean, I'm thinking, going back to Mrs Thatcher, that in a sense uh, unleashed the financial markets, deregulated them. Um, and I think you know, she has this phrase, um, get the government off the back of the people. But actually, what she did was to get the people off the back of government and allow the markets to to control government. So I think the institutional flaws are to do with the, the breaking of the connections between the people and, and, and government. So that in a way government is now just miles away from the people um, and so easily grabbed by private interests. Parties, policies are typically dictated from above by their leaders. Uh, in many cases, they are on the margins of criminality because how they are funded uh, is not easily resolved and it typically involves not only in Britain, uh, not only in the United States, but in many other democracies it involves going to the very rich and powerful for money that is then laundered through the party in order to carry out election campaigns. There is a strong feeling among electorates that parties fudge issues, that they say one thing, they do another, or that when there is a large parties vying for the center ground, they become indistinguishable. The interesting question is, for large numbers of people, why political parties? What do they actually do for us, except try to manipulate our votes, except to try to get us out to, to vote in a system where there is not compulsory voting. And there is a serious identity crisis, I think, which is breaking out. And that's very serious for the future of democracy because uh, one of the linchpins, one of the, 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 the central nervous systems of democracy in our times is open, clean, fair elections in which different viewpoints battle it out. That's why parties are functionally necessary. Of course, the role of money in politics uh, is, is corrupting in, so, in some ways. But the bigger problem is the, the way in which special interests can organize themselves against all possible uh, uh, efforts to in some way take benefits away from them. Uh, because that means the whole system gets paralyzed. And these special interests are sometimes big business, but sometimes they are retirees. Sometimes they are unions. The, the, the problem is that all of them have the power, so nothing ever gets done. Because on any change in policy, someone is going to be negatively affected. And those people can organize themselves, and they care much more about this issue than society at large. So they will hammer the system and, and, and batter it in because the system is increasingly open. 
This is what I mean when I say there's a, a democratic flaw in the system. The system is so open that it overweighs the, the negative efforts of these special interests and underweighs the importance of society in general. Twee analyses die eigenlijk neerkomen op een hele simpele constatering. We hebben te veel democratie of we hebben er juist te weinig van. Laten we met die vraag in ons achterhoofd eens uitzoomen. Hoe gaat het met het project dat eind vorige eeuw zo voortvarend van start leek te gaan? De verspreiding van de democratie over de rest van de wereld. So far, you would have to say that there is a trend towards ever more democracy. Uh, and certainly in the Western world, there has been a trend towards ever more democracy. The, the simple numbers are clear. In 1900, uh, democracy was something that was practiced in a small handful of countries that were nestled around the North Atlantic, you know, Western Europe, really Northwestern Europe and the United States and Canada. Today, you have, a, I don't remember the exact number, but it's about 100 countries that, that have democratic systems. Uh, that would be considered reasonably legitimate. Will it go on forever? That is, I think, the crucial question. Right now is a particularly, I would say, in the grand scheme of things, now is not a particularly strong moment for democracy. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's democracies that have been particularly hurt by a, a global economic recession. Uh, unemployment in countries is at very high levels. Uh, discontent is high. Um, the politics in individual countries, particularly in the United States, uh, w which I know best, is um, very polarizing. Um, it's very bitter. It's also true that some of the problems are, have been generated by democracies themselves, um, and particularly when we think globally. So, it's very hard for people who are not living in a democracy to look up to the mantle of democracy and what it stands for when they see um, images like um, Abu Ghraib, uh, when they're reminded of the continued presence of Guantanamo, when the headlines for many years were, uh, were focused on the war in Iraq. These were not uh, wonderful signposts for the virtues of democracy. While we have seen an expansion of democracy, uh, at every sense, the opening up of the system, greater transparency, greater openness, I'm not sure it has always come with better government, uh, better politics. In fact, over the last 20 or 30 years, I think you could make the, the case that you have seen a worse political system develop in many Western countries uh, and in Western-style democracies, I'm thinking of Israel, which has uh, increasingly opened up its political system and produced greater and greater polarization, dysfunction, paralysis. Why has there been a decline in the number of, um, of democracies or political or economic freedoms in the world today it has more to do with the authoritarian governments than it does with the democracies. There are a number of sort of critical things. One in particular is the events of recent time. In particular, the color revolutions is, is sort of noted as being a bright line where a number of regimes around the world woke up to the possible danger that they too could have a color revolution in their midst. And so you see from that moment in time, these regimes becoming much more active and aggressive in making sure that they don't go the way of Ukraine, Serbia, or Georgia. One of the great threats that these regimes have faced and that they noted in the color revolutions was a robust civil society, uh, the growth of NGOs um, who, who were able to really clamor for and put pressure on the regime to uh, bring freedoms in, in other areas of life. Well, not only have they curtailed the ability of these organizations to operate, but they've also gone one step further, which is to create their own NGOs. State government operated NGOs, which are sometimes referred to as gongos. Um, and the gongo has uh, several purposes. One, it crowds out the legitimate NGOs that do exist. Um, so it becomes much more difficult for the public to understand who to believe, because when the gongo, which will have a name like you know, support for human rights in Egypt, um, which sounds quite, well, 
wonderful and, and innocuous, will issue reports that will suggest that, well, there are human rights problems in Egypt, but they're not systematic. Or the situation, we have, we have problems and there are things that we need to work on, but we're getting better. So they seem credible to the public, but at the same time, they paint a much rosier picture than what is actually the case. Beyond that, they also, these organizations, soak up funding. It is the case that the United States and EU entities have been funding what are gongos. So um, it also that drains the possible resources that are there for those who are legitimate human rights defenders or NGOs. Um, that's an innovation. There are experiments going on in the age of the internet. China is, I think, at the cutting edge, where governments cleverly are developing tools for using the internet to control the internet for undemo undemocratic ends. For example, through the recruitment of what are called internet debaters, 50 cent bloggers. If on the internet a firestorm develops of protest against the authorities, the Communist Party authorities, then one way of dealing with this is to recruit a million or two bloggers who respond and who swamp the protest with their own pro-government views. It's a very 21st century cutting edge development. We do not have evidence, but certainly you do see that uh, government is in proactive mood. They do need, they, they wanted to, to use all possible ways to undermine this kind of real threat to them. They understand they're fighting an uphill battle and the pure censorship cannot work. They should change their image. And, but on the other hand, the, uh, some blogs become increasingly critical of Chinese leaders, and um, they are not censored. And uh, of course, government now has some trouble to deal with that uh, issue. One person, is, his name, name is Han Han, uh, from Shanghai, 28 years old, high school dropout, and uh, his blog uh, uh, has 330 million hits over the past few years. And uh, most of his essays in that blog is quite critical of the Chinese government. Yes, Chinese government could censor Google, could, could arrest uh, Liu Xiaobo, Charter 08, but they cannot arrest Han Han. He is so popular among, particularly among uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, college students, and particularly female students. What would <laughs> happen if they would arrest him? Uh, there would be a revolution because the regime lost moral high ground, period. Completely, completely. There are some of the things they could not do. Is the internet key? Absolutely, it is. Um, it's the case that um, in Egypt today, for example, bloggers are more likely to be persecuted than print journalists. Um, what would Tiananmen Square have looked like if people had had mobile phones, if people had had video, uh, the ability to take video off of their phone. Um, the internet is a crucial way for allowing individual actors to be able to share information globally in an instant. This is not something, this is a pressure that these regimes did not have to deal with before. Um, and so they are working very hard to come up with ways to try and stay ahead of it. It's very much a, a foot race of technology. And it's very important to realize that the regimes are quite capable of using the technology too. Um, because although it's, it's the case that I might be able to use a cell phone to uh, document a human rights abuse happening in the street, if I'm an activist, it's also true that my cell phone perhaps is everything that the regime needs to convict me. Because what it may have on it is the complete contact list of everyone within this social or political movement. It, it documents my whereabouts. It shows you where I've been um, and gives you, you know, all the names of the people who I communicate with. Uh, so um, now people are leaving their fingerprints. But, you know, innovation is something that's ongoing. And so you can have, you, there's an example um, that I like in particular of, of one person who he was you know, a mid-level computer programmer uh, living in San Francisco. Knows nothing about Iran. But when he witnessed the 
um, protests and then ultimate crackdown on Iranians um, last June, he quit his job and he developed a program to allow um, Iranians to communicate securely from Iran. Um, and this is something that the regime still hasn't been able to figure out quite how to, how to get around. De strijd om de democratie in de boze buitenwereld is dus vooral een gevecht tussen uitvinders in cyberspace. Maar hoe zit dat bij ons, in de landen met een democratische traditie? Wat hebben onze denkers hier voor innovaties te bieden? Uh, you know, John Dewey once said that the, the only cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. And that has been the operating assumption of Western democracies. Anytime there's a problem, it must be that what we need is more democracy, more openness, more participation. I wonder whether that's true. I wonder whether we have reached a critical mass where increased participation, increased democracy, increased transparency is actually producing dysfunction, populism, pandering, uh, and is in some ways subverting the purpose of, de of, of democratic systems, which are, after all, to protect individual liberties, individual rights, and promote social welfare. Since 1945, about a hundred power scrutinizing, power monitoring institutions have been born that never existed before in the history of democracy. The spread of human rights organizations, participatory budgeting, citizens' assemblies, Truth and Reconciliation Tribunals, Integrity Commissions, the growth of watchdogs. These have changed the landscape, the political geography of democracy, so that democracy, in the age of monitory democracy, as I call it, means free, fair, clean elections, certainly. Uh, the importance of the elected representative through a party system into parliaments whose job is to constrain executive power. But democracy comes to mean much more than that. It comes to mean, at its best, when it works well, it comes to mean the permanent public monitoring, the permanent public scrutiny of governmental and business power. I don't think we have a monetary democracy now. I think we have um, a democracy which um, claims to be ruling in the name of the people, but is not responsive to the people when they try to monitor it and they try to get control over it. But then I, I think that there needs to be mechanisms by which people's own solutions, the creativity of the people, rather than just the um, uh, capacity to refuse, but the capacity to create has got to be part of a, a democracy. And I, I think that, therefore, a monetary democracy is not enough. I think we're talking about constant experiment and constant um, sort of struggle and process. But I think there are many examples of glimpses of, of a working system. Um, I mean, the one that, that, that I begin the book with and in a way shows that it's possible is in the city of Porto Alegre in southern Brazil, where a party was elected that really did believe that it had only got power because of the movements and civic organizations that had supported it. So its determination was when it got into office, it would share power, it would go back to those movements. And so when it found that the finances were in a complete mess, instead of just doing deals with other parties and other parts of the political elite, it said, no, we'll go back to the citizens look at what's happened, discuss with them the solutions. And out of that came um, a, a system which is still in place. I mean, um, there are always problems called the participatory budget through which people across the city participate in a process of setting the budgetary priority. Well, you know, California is in some ways the great uh, experimental uh, grounds for this kind of uh, bottom-up democracy through a process called the initiative process, which are basically referendums. And the Californians have had many, many referendums over the last 25 years, a, pro a process that began really in full flower in the early 70s. Uh, and I would 
simply characterize most of these the referendums as taking, taking this form. People always say in the referendums they want low taxes, and they always say they want lots of government services and subsidies. So some people say, no, 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 what we want is not a simple referendum. We want to involve people in the budgeting. And if you involve ordinary people in the budget budgeting, which can only happen at a very local process, they will understand that there are these trade-offs that you have to make, that you can't have low taxes and high spending. I say to that, maybe. I have not seen a case where it has actually worked. Uh, what I see happen when you, in, when you involve more people in the process is that it actually becomes more dysfunctional, more chaotic. In the 70s, and I don't want to romanticize it, there was a very clear and vivid, effective notion of democratizing the state rather than privatizing it. And, but I think that would have meant the politicians sharing power and the social democratic parties throughout Europe just could not face sharing power. We have to rethink political parties in a way which sees them as not the sort of leadership of political change, not the holders of a sort of monopoly on political change, but as the organisational aspect of a movement for change, which is about bringing together ideas, experiences into a, a, an agreed political program, which can be put before the voters and be the basis of political debate. But that the actual processes of um, creating change come from within society. Well, let me say something you know, that will be proved to be, I'm sure, very unpopular in a European context, which is I think, first of all, that the Europeans have gotten it right in theory, which is what, what modern democratic systems need is uh, not more participation. We have lots of participation. We have lots of monitoring. We have lots of transparency. What we need is some effectiveness. If you had not had the European Commission, you would never have gotten any of these countries over the last 25 years, from Italy and, and, and Spain, to come into remote, you know, to in any way get their public finances in order. I realize they now look bad, but for 15 years, many, many of these countries had very strong public finances and had very good growth as a result of that. And that was only for one reason, because you had unelected officials in Brussels who were not, did not have to worry about pandering to public opinion, say, you have to get your budget deficit down. You have to open up your market to this. You have to create a, a better legal system that allows for you know, a fair play on this, on this issue. That system is, to my mind, a very interesting model of modern democracy. So what some people would call the lack of democratic scrutiny in Brussels is our asset. Exactly. I like the lack of democratic scrutiny in Brussels because it allows these people in Brussels to identify common interests, long-term interests, and to push countries to do it. At the end of the day, democracy always triumphs. A national government can always say no. An election can always be a referendum on these issues. Zo sleutelen we verder en struikelen voort op het hobbelige pad van de democratie. Maar we kunnen sleutelen wat we willen, wat als de rest van de wereld uiteindelijk een andere weg heen slaat. Aangevoerd door China. Waarheen is het postcommunistische groeimonster eigenlijk op weg? Imagine the next global superpower that is post-democratic. Where the historic formula, no bourgeois, no democracy, famously put by Barrington Moore Jr., an American historian in the 1950s. And I mean, this formula, no bourgeois, no democracy, it's also a very Dutch formula, by the way, that goes back into the 16th century in the Low Countries. Um, it could be that this formula no longer applies, that one could have a bourgeoisie, one could have a large middle class, which is more or less self-satisfied with an authoritarian one-party system where periodic elections, a civil society, multi-party system, free functioning parliaments are simply done away with. One can imagine this. And were it to come to pass, this would have uh, enormous global consequences. Imagine a dominant power 
which in Spanish America or in Africa or in its dealings with Europe simply does not have at the center of its foreign policy and its dealings with uh, institutions and peoples of the world. It has no democratic criteria. You know, 10 years ago, you never heard the term of the Chinese middle class, but, we, but now everyone talk about the middle class in China. They are real. And um, now middle class not, uh, for a long time want stability. So they become the best allies for the Chinese Communist Party. But now the middle class concern is that uh, there's uh, another class actually dominated power. This is the, what they call the black collar uh, class vis-a-vis white collar uh, uh, class because they believe some rich, uh, super rich business people join hand with corrupt officials become the establishment, the top uh, group. They are very corrupted. They monopolized all the resources. So middle class still started to challenge that you know, super class, that, uh, that uh, the, they call the black collar uh, uh, class. So that is just the beginning. At the same time, the media, yes, there's some government censorship, of course, that uh, with the Google case, with many other things. But at the same time, you also see, because of commercialization of media, some of the uh, uh, newspapers, magazines, television really push envelope, particularly dealing with c- official corruption. And some of the blogs, and uh, run by young, the so-called uh, post-80 generation, become increasingly articulate to criticize government uh, abuse of power, official abuse of power, calling for dem- more democratic change. Right now, frankly, it is the most successful governing system in the world. There's, n- there's simply no question about it. If you look at the, tr- the choices they're making, the resources they're devoting, they have just, for example, decided to double uh, spending on education because they realize that they need to move up the value chain and they need to be producing higher and higher quality products, not just greater quantity. And so they're doubling, literally doubling as a percentage of GDP, the spending on education. What democratic system could do that? Yes, you can say that the democracy may be less effective in terms of quick reaction. But the thing is, in a democracy, you have a mandate it's difficult to, you know, they, get, they have the, uh, the, the, the constitutional protection. But these Chinese leaders, they do not have legitimacy. Who selected you? Who appointed you? Previously, their legitimacy is based on economic growth, which was very successful. Recently, they already see the change. Their legitimacy based on distribution, fairness, social harmony, social justice, not just pure economic growth. Eventually, they will move to another one. It's what the Premier Wen Jiabao recently said, the dignity of the people. Give some respect to the people. So that's a basic human rights. That's a political reform. The Chinese model would work, except that there is no model, by which I mean the Chinese have somehow stumbled into a very peculiar situation where they have an, an unelected, unaccountable, a technocratic elite that yet are not cor- not highly corrupt and most importantly are instituting pro-growth policies for the country. Most of the time when you get an unelected elite running a country, you get mass corruption, uh, you get total misallocation of resources, and you get terrible economic policies as a consequence. You know, in other words, most of the time you don't get the Chinese Communist Party, you get Mobutu mm-hmm. or Marcos. Why you've gotten the Chinese Communist Party, nobody really knows. And nobody understands, for example, why the system works as it does in, the, in even limiting the terms of these people. Jiang Zemin comes into power after Deng Xiaoping, and he serves two terms and then leaves. And now Hu Jintao will come in and serve two terms and leave, and his successor will come in and serve two terms and leave. How many dictatorships have rotating presidencies where the, where the person literally leaves office after two terms. So the Chinese system is very peculiar. China could not go to like a Western multi-party system overnight because there's no opposition party to compete with this 76 million people party. It's a gigantic organization. And uh, so therefore, the, the, the changes within party or factions within the party become important. 
This is what I call one party, two factions. Yes, uh, Chinese leadership, uh, China is not ready for multi-party system. They will not allow other party to emerge at the moment. But it does not mean that Chinese leadership is a monolithic group with same values, same attitude, same interests. It's not, because they're quite diversified in many different ways, represent different regions, different social groups. The elites have different backgrounds, political associations, and etc. So they compete for each other. So these kind of two coalitions or two factions, one represents the interests of coastal region and the well-to-do middle class, rising entrepreneurs, the other represent the inland region, less advantaged social groups like migrant workers, farmers, urban poor. Now, they found that a representative in the Central Committee, in the Policy Bureau, this is the power lies in China. So the fractions become uh, uh, increasingly transparent and not the legitimacy yet. They compete for power, policy initiative, and protect the interests of different social groups different regions. So that's a very healthy development in my view. Mm-hmm. For the long run, that kind of practice may eventually lead the party split. But the question is whether that spirit could be achieved in a peaceful way or rather than end up with a violent way. So we don't know the answer, but uh, in the next one or two decades, we will see that the unfolding political change in China. We laten het even machtige als raadselachtige oosten voor wat het nu is. Want ondertussen komen we handen tekort in onze eigen achtertuin. Waar migratie het populisme aanjaagt binnen de toch al verzwakte instituties. Nog vier weken campagne te gaan. Laat duizend bloemen bloeien. Ik denk dat een van de grote failings van politicians, nationale politicians in Europa has been on the immigration issue, making people understand what the long-term in, uh, stakes for Europe are. Because I, I'm, a, I'm somebody who believes in the European economic model. I think that, by and large, the European economic model is a pretty successful one. I mean, we in the United States do some things better. Labor mobility is clearly much better in the U.S., but you do some things much better. Uh, healthcare is much better, and pensions, by and large, are in better shape. The big problem you face is dem- demography. You simply can't have a society of retirees. You have to have young workers. And politicians have been so reluctant to explain to the, to the European people that, look, you have to have young workers. And you know what? They are going to come from poor countries. You know, you're not going to get immigrants from Japan. <laughs> you're not going to get immigrants from Sweden. Uh, you're going to get immigrants from poor countries. That's why, they, that's why they come, for economic opportunity. And that means our task is to try to find a way to assimilate them, to make them feel uh, a part of the society. And of course, they have obligations. But that is a long-term vision of a society. And the short term, it's much easier to bash the Moroccans, to bash the Algerians, to accuse them of, of being backward and, and, and ignorant and poor. There are populist leaders who like to simplify things, to put things in simple boxes, simple categories, in order to attract votes. Much more difficult, but much more attractive, much more important for the future of parties is the emergence of a new crop of leaders who can explain publicly and win affection for the view that life is rather complex, that matters, that politics is the difficult art of deciding who gets what, when and how for the sake of justice and to do so openly. That's very hard. You know, I think that we've got to realise our own power as consumers, as workers, as citizens and and organise around that power. Now, you know, I don't think that's necessarily going to be automatically successful, but, but it's... You know, just the fact that they have power doesn't mean that we're powerless. We've got to, we've got to recognise how how dependent supposed, the supposedly powerful are on us. And now for the impossible question: mm. Where are we fifty years from now? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I would say when we look at it from that broad spectrum, um, I'm I'm optimistic. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm generally much more pessimistic in the near term, um, but in the long term, I do think that what these, the inherent flaws that these regimes have, I think are quite great. Um, the problem for democracy is that many of the arguments that one can make for it 
are in the negative, um, by which I mean that the process of democracy can be very messy, uh, but it's still the best alternative that we have. Um, it, it consistently produces results that have a, a legitimacy that these other regimes, these other uh, political systems simply lack. Democracy is something of an anti-utopia. It's a political vision uh, of a world where grand ideals are constrained. They're humbled. Democracy at its best is the rule of the humble. That is, democracy and humility are virtues. They are twins. That democracy is this never-ending, never entirely successful, ongoing process of attempting publicly to control the exercise of power. Never ever to be realized in pure form, but a struggle that can never be given up. If we can't get ourselves together and, and, and rationalize our systems so that we are investing in the future, so that we are trying to compete in this new world, we will, we will slide slowly but gently into a kind of irrelevance. Mm. We'll, be, you know, we'll be fine, I don't predict catastrophe, but the West as the engine of history uh, will be over. Well, I cannot say about 50 years from now, but I can say 20 years from now. I think that by that time, we will not see the Communist Party. I think the party will either uh, 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 spread itself or will become one of the, one of the contenders for the party. And uh, that's, that's my prediction. Within 20 years? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, it's not what I said. When Jiabao, when he had that interview with CNN, with Zakuria, he was asking that question, in the same question. When Jiabao said, 20 years is a long time, I cannot answer that question. He did not say the Communist Party will continue to be ruled, will really represent the interests of people. He said, only time will tell, but I can tell you one thing, China will become more democratic. Thank you very much. I just say much more, you know, than he does. Yeah. Okay, that's it.